Welcome to our annual scientific review at the Starting Strength Coaches Association Conference in lovely, lovely Wichita Falls, Texas. Today, uh, we're going to talk about strength and endurance. Uh, there's a great deal of discussion about the relative in importance and impact and interaction of strength and endurance training on our forums, in our gyms, uh, on the interwebs, and in the larger community much of it foolish and misinformed. Uh, for example, despite frequent accusations to the contrary, uh, the starting strength model has never, to my knowledge, dismissed the importance of endurance or conditioning. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the impact of strength training on endurance and vice versa, and the optimal approach to conditioning for various populations uh, remain important and contentious topics. This year, our rather ambitious, perhaps overambitious task uh, was to evaluate the available scientific literature on strength and endurance training and their interactions and present to you a review of what we think is known or is at least believed uh, about this topic, comparing and contrasting at all levels of biological organization, from the biochemical and bioenergetic uh, to the level of cell signaling and genetic modulation uh, to systems physiology and cardiovascular physiology, to actual performance. Uh, this is a lot of material to cover, and uh, our presentation will necessarily be hitting only the high points of what we looked at. I think in total our panel probably looked at, guys, we probably looked at five, seven hundred papers, something like that, uh, in preparation for this. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I want to dive right in, and we will take questions during a Q&A and panel discussion at the end. Uh, I'm Jonathan Sullivan. I'm a starting strength coach. Uh, I'm a physician. I have a physiology research background, and I'm the owner and operator of Graysteel Strength and Conditioning in Farmington, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Austin Baraki is a specialist in internal medicine, a starting strength coach, uh, and a competitive power lifter. Dr. John Patrizzo is also a competitive power lifter and a starting strength coach and works in the field of physical therapy and exercise physiology at Adelphi University. And CJ Gocher is a starting strength coach and power lifter who often writes on fitness and coaches at Ironmonger's Gym and CrossFit 760. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the extraordinary amount of hard work that you did in preparing for today's presentation. Um, we're going to begin with my very compressed review and overview of muscle physiology and bioenergetics in the, contents, in the context of strength and endurance training. Uh, and this will be the foundation for the increasingly more relevant material to follow. <coughs> Dr. Brocky will follow me with a presentation on cell signaling and genetic responses to strength and endurance training. Dr. Patrizzo will briefly discuss the systems and particularly cardiovascular physiology uh, response to exercise. And C.J. Gocher gets to bring it on home and give us the money shot by presenting us with what the available evidence tells us about the impact of various training regimes on actual strength uh, uh, and endurance performance. So we're going to begin with what's known at the bioenergetic, uh, biochemical, and cellular level. So recall that muscle is a highly hierarchical uh, structured tissue and is essentially a bundle of bundles. The actin and myosin filaments that slide against each other produce movement are bundled together in uh, myofibrils arranged into a sarcomere architecture, um, the contractile units. The myofibrils are bundled together into muscle cells, the muscle cells are bundled together into fascicles, and the fascicles are bundled together into whole muscles by a connective tissue sheet. The muscle cell membrane, or sarcolemma as it's called, has a highly elaborate structure uh, with invaginations on the surface that lead into a network of tunnels called the T-tubules uh, that extend deep into the muscle cell so that any depolarization of the muscle cell membrane is carried deep into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, where it comes into close proximity with another network of membrane-bound cavities, the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is packed with calcium ions, and that's important as we'll see presently. When we initiate muscle movement, uh, the signal is ultimately carried by a lower motor neuron, uh, 
uh, to the muscle cell, which synapses with the muscle cell uh, at the motor end plate and releases acetylcholine, uh, the neurotransmitter from the nerve terminal. The acetylcholine neurotransmitter binds with its receptors on the sarcolemma, triggering ion channels to open and depolarization or excitation of the muscle cell membrane. And this wave of depolarization because of the T tubules is carried deep inside the muscle cell um, and in turn triggers the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is a critical event in leaking depolarization of the muscle cell membrane with muscle contraction or excitation contraction coupling because it's the release of calcium that enables the actin and myosin filaments to bind to each other so that muscle contraction can occur uh, with attendant consumption of ATP. Uh, this is followed by a reset of the muscle cell to allow for the next contraction, which is also a highly energy dependent process. Uh, this is just to refresh your memory that the engagement of the myosin with the actin so that uh, muscle contraction can occur is a highly energy dependent process uh, requiring the hydrolysis of ATP. In fact, uh, the myosin chain is what we call an ATPase, an enzyme that hydrolyzes ATP and releases energy for a biological process, uh, in this case movement. Once contraction has occurred, more energy is consumed to reset the muscle and prepare it for another round of contraction. Uh, the restoration of ionic gradients, uh, the repolarization of the muscle cell membrane, uh, repacking the sarcoplasmic reticulum with calcium ions, um, restoring phosphocreatine and ATP levels, uh, removal of reaction products and so on, all of this is highly energy dependent and in fact a very significant proportion of total muscle energy expenditure is used not for contraction but for restoring the muscle cell to prepare it for another contraction. This brings us to a brief but necessary review of bioenergetics uh, which is all about energy transfer in living systems which means it's also about ATP, the energy currency of the cell. ATP gives up its terminal high energy phosphate uh, to release energy, resulting in a spent low energy ADP molecule, uh, some inorganic phosphate, and the release of energy for biological processes, including mechanical work. Uh, recharging ADP to ATP is a big part of what bioenergetics is all about. The biological energy systems fall into two main categories, which we tend to call aerobic and anaerobic, uh, terms which are increasingly seen as inexact at best. Uh, in higher animals, which includes most of you, um, these systems are rarely pure or purely aerobic or anaerobic, but are actually highly interdependent and highly integrated. I prefer to think of them as the cytosolic and mitochondrial energy systems, or the anaerobic and aerobic energy systems, respectively. And each can be further subdivided into cytosolic one and two and mitochondrial one and two. Cytosolic energy system one is what is sometimes called the phosphagen system, probably more accurately called the immediate energy system or the substrate level phosphorylation system, but phosphagen will do for our purposes. And it consists of the ATP that's already present in the muscle cell at the time contraction is initiated, which at maximal effort would probably last you about two seconds at most. It also consists of the adenylate kinase reaction, which uh, uses two ADPs to generate an ATP, and the very important creatine kinase cycle with which you're all familiar. And this energy system, uh, cytosolic one, is extremely high in power output. It produces ATP and energy very, very quickly. Um, and as a result, its capacity is very, very low on the order of about 10 to 12 seconds at most, depending on the activity uh, and the intensity of effort. We'll see this inverse relationship between power and capacity over and over again when we look at energy systems. So this energy system dominates in very high power output brief events like putting a shot or throwing a javelin or a high jump and limit singles in strength competition and training. This is a cartoon of the phosphagen system at work. Uh, ATP hydrolysis yields energy uh, to do work and results in a spent ADP residue. Now, 
you could recharge this ADP back to ATP by sending it back to the mitochondria and letting oxidative phosphorylation recharge it. Uh, but because you have the creatine cycle present, you can instantly recharge that ADP with high energy phosphate from phosphocreatine and do that on the spot so that you can continue working in this very high power energy system. Cytosolic 2 is what is traditionally called uh, anaerobic glycolysis or more correctly fast glycolysis. And here the 6 carbon sugar glucose is rapidly split into two 3 carbon pyruvate fragments uh, that immediately yields two ATPs and some high energy electrons that have been stripped out of the uh, high uh, energy chemical bonds of the sugar. Those are used later. The two ATPs uh, is far lower than the total energy yield of glucose, which, is, you know, which can yield theoretically up to 38 ATPs, but they're available right now. So this energy system is very fast, which means it's very powerful. And because it's very powerful, it has a very low capacity. You can't continue in it for very long. So this system is important for sprints and multiple rep sets and gymnastic routines, wrestling matches, sets of five, and so on. The mitochondria and the mitochondrial energy systems are where all the oxygen is consumed. And the mitochondrial energy systems are what we commonly call the aerobic energy systems. Uh, they cannot continue under anoxic conditions. And they have a wide range of power outputs from low to moderately high. Uh, but mitochondrial metabolism has a very, very large capacity, so it permits very extended bouts of activity. So, for example, at Graysteel, I have an athlete who has demonstrated his ability to continue working in a system for more than 90 years. He's a very aerobic individual, right, as are, as are we all. So mitochondrial system one uh, consists of the Krebs and the beta cycles, of which only the Krebs is illustrated here, uh, which are involved in the metabolism of carbohydrate and fat, respectively and which generate a small amount of ATP and continue the process of stripping hot electrons out of food molecules to be burned later. Right here, in fact, these hot electrons then enter mitochondrial system two, uh, where the electron transport system and the process of oxidative phosphorylation uh, combine those high energy electrons with oxygen. Uh, during all of these processes, what's happening is these high energy electrons are sort of flowing in a stepwise regulated fashion down an energy waterfall uh, and giving up their energy in regulated steps uh, until they finally combine with oxygen in low energy bonds to form water, which is not food, right? Precisely because it doesn't have high energy electrons that can be used for biological energy. So uh, the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation mitochondrial system two, this is the big payoff step uh, where you get the mother load of the ATP. This diagram is not meant to overwhelm you with detail, but simply to illustrate to you graphically that all of these energy systems are highly integrated and interdependent and are always working together. Um, none of them are purely anaerobic or aerobic, and they're always working together, contributing to a common ATP or energy pool. And together, all of these energy systems form a very, very versatile continuum of power and capacity uh, from the very uh, brief but high-powered uh, phosphogen system uh, to the very extended but low-powered mitochondrial energy systems. And as coaches and as athletes, we would like to exploit all of these energy systems. We want to be able to, e e even the most highly specialized athlete needs to operate across this continuum of energy systems, right? So if you're an endurance athlete, you need to dip in to your cytosolic energy system sometimes to sort of like sprint ahead and push through. And if you're an endurance athlete, uh, uh, if you're a, a strength athlete uh, or a power athlete, you need to be able to have some stamina, if for nothing else than just you know to complete a heavy workout. So we want to be able to have some degree of ability to work in all of these energy systems, which is kind of what we're talking about today. These energy systems find expression in the diversity of muscle fiber types and motor units. A motor unit is a motor neuron, as you'll recall, with all of the muscle cells that it innervates. And when the motor neuron fires, 
all the muscle cells that it innervates also fire. And all of these muscle fibers are of the same fiber type. They are either small, low power, type 1, oxidative, fatigue resistant fibers, or larger, high power, type 2, mixed oxidative glycolytic, fatigue resistant fibers, or large, high powered, highly glycolytic, highly fatigable type 2X fibers. And they tend to get larger as you go from 1 to 2A to 2X. When we engage in exercise, these various motor unit types are recruited in something like an orderly damn fashion, uh, with low powered type 1 units being recruited first. But as force production or effort or time increase, uh, larger motor units uh, with their type 2 fibers will increasingly be recruited. This is uh, a trainable phenomenon and is what we call the size principle. Smaller, lower power motor units are recruited first. So, with your first semester of exercise physiology out of the way, we now have the foundation to take a similarly brief review uh, of what the available data tells us about the basic biology of strength training and endurance training and about maximal intermittent exercise. Maximal intermittent exercise is a field of study that's been with us since the 60s, uh, and it forms a sort of middle ground form of training uh, that enriches and complicates the picture considerably and which has become an area of intense interest uh, in coaching and in research under the name of HIT or high intensity interval training. We used to just call it maximal interval, uh, maximal intermittent training or sprint interval training. Now we call it HIT. And to begin with, when we look at the literature, uh, there's a profound lack of standardization and tremendous variability in experimental training protocols, especially when it comes to strength training protocols. However, in general, uh, it's safe to say that strength training is characterized by high force and power outputs, uh, brief bouts of effort, and varying degrees of interset rest. Uh, and in this regard, it is in fact a kind of interval training, if you think about it. Uh, it produces adaptations in strength and power and hypertrophy and in anaerobic power or anaerobic capacity. Endurance training, on the other hand, is sustained continuous activity conducted at low power and with low force and without intercept rest uh, because there are no intervals. Uh, you rest when the race is over. Um, e uh, endurance training, it produces adaptations in endurance, in muscle oxidative capacity, in mitochondrial density, muscle capillarity, and VO2 max. HIT is sort of the interesting middle ground, uh, possibly best studied in uh, Gibala's uh, very impressive body of work, much of which uses a bicycle ergometer protocol with 30 seconds of all-out effort interspersed with four-minute rests. Um, but there are other diverse protocols in the literature, including from G uh, Gibala himself. HIT is conducted at very high intensities but low force outputs with brief bouts interspersed with uh, relatively brief rests. So it has some superficial similarities to strength training. It produces a wide range of adaptations uh, with improvements in both anaerobic and uh, aerobic power performance. So if we look at these three forms of exercises in the context of energy systems and fiber recruitments, we see a spectrum in which strength training is dominated by cytosolic or anaerobic energy systems and endurance training is dominated by mitochondrial or aerobic energy systems, and HIT seems to bridge the gap. Uh, on the other hand, endurance training does call on cytosolic energy systems, uh, on cytosolic metabolism, although at a low level, and there are reasons to believe that strength training calls on oxidative metabolism uh, more than we might tend to think during a training bout, and certainly during interset rest. Uh, in fact, uh, you, you just here's one example. The rate of reaccumulation of phosphocreatine in the muscle after a, a strength training bout or after a bout of HIT, right, what's called the KPCR, the, the rate constant of phosphocreatine reaccumulation in the muscle, has been used by any number of authors as a measure of oxidative capacity, right? So it's your aerobic metabolism that restores phosphocreatine after a bout of exercise. Uh, HIT seems to be dominated by cytosolic or anaerobic energy systems uh, 
but mitochondrial metabolism certainly plays an important role and it becomes more important in successive bouts. Um, both resistance training for strength and HIT seem to affect the more comprehensive recruitment of motor units to the extent that we have good data. And traditionally, endurance training it, uh, generally fails to recruit a large body of type two motor units. So again, we see a certain similarity between strength training and HIT. When we look at fuels and substrates, we see another continuum from the heavy reliance of strength training on phosphocreatine uh, to the heavy reliance of endurance training on fat. Uh, on the other hand, uh, glycolysis, which utilizes carbohydrate, is in fact important in strength training. And there's probably even a contribution from uh, oxidation of fat as well during actual strength training bouts. That's Tesh's work. Uh, in endurance training, both carbohydrate and fat are important, but as you increase the intensity of endurance training, carbohydrate becomes progressively more important. HIT uses the entire range of substrates, although the relative contribution in HIT is, on my reading, not as fully uh, well characterized as it is for endurance training. If we look at cytosolic energy system adaptations, uh, the so-called anaerobic adaptations, we find that they are minimal in endurance training and maximal in strength training and in HIT. Again, HIT and strength training uh, seem to be more like each other than either one of them is like endurance training. However, this similarity disappears when we look at adaptations in the mitochondrial energy system. Here, endurance training and HIT both demonstrate marked increases in muscle oxidative capacity, uh, which strength training apparently does not, um, at least not on the preponderance of the available data. Uh, most authors report no improvement or even a decline in muscle oxidative capacity with strength training. Uh, most studies, and there are some, that do show an improvement in muscle oxidative capacity with strength training uh, use older or more deconditioned subject and they use protocols that look more like circuit training or old school high intensity training than they do like classic strength training. They tend to use shorter rest intervals and so on. So we have to be very careful with the literature out there that says that we can improve muscle oxidative capacity with strength training. We have to, you can't just read the abstract, you have to look at it closely. We find the same thing if we look at mitochondrial density, which you could call an aerobic adaptation, and which is increased by both endurance training and HIT, but not, so goes the conventional wisdom by strength training. But we need to be careful here, too, because most of the data on this topic evaluates either mitochondrial proteins and enzyme activities, or the activity of markers of mitochondrial biogenesis, like PGC1-alpha, rather than evaluation of actual mitochondria. So when I look at the literature, I find almost nothing in the way of convincing ultrastructural evaluation of the actual number uh, and size and mitochondrial volume. Um, it's basically looking at surrogate markers of mitochondrial density. So the data on this in my reading is a little bit iffy. When it comes to hypertrophy, strength training is clearly the king. Uh, with a nearly universal observation uh, of increased muscle mass. Uh, on the other hand, endurance training, as you know, does not produce such an adaptation, and neither does HIT. Uh, pretty convincing evidence in the literature that HIT does not produce significant muscle hypertrophy. So, when we try to uh, very roughly summarize what the literature tells us in this sort of crude graphical manner that I put together for you here, uh, you begin to see something of a paradox. Uh, when it comes to the ability to produce force, all of these forms of exercise produce what we could call the expected result, uh, given the principle of specificity. Strength training improves strength, um, while endurance training and HIT, not so much. Uh, strength training has a well-documented positive effect on muscle hypertrophy, uh, whereas endurance training does not. And HIT apparently doesn't either. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, but when we look at energy system adaptations, we should begin to scratch our heads a little bit. Strength training uh, produces cytosolic energy adaptations, uh, 
uh, okay, and endurance training mitochondrial adaptations, okay. But HIT, which is conducted towards the anaerobic end of the spectrum, produces pretty profound adaptations not only in the cytosolic range, as we might expect, but also in the mitochondrial range. In fact, we see really powerful adaptations in mitochondrial metabolism and aerobic capacity and performance. Uh, we see increases in mitochondrial and oxidative enzyme content and in the VO2 max, even though on its face, this form of exercise is more like resistance training than it is like endurance training. Same thing uh, when we look at the available data, data on capillarity and uh, mitochondrial density. Strength training and endurance training produce what we could call expected adaptations, but HIP promotes a more aerobic phenotype in spite of being at least superficially more like strength training. But it also produces an increase in anaerobic power with increased expression and activity of cytosolic and uh, anaerobic enzymes like phosphofructokinase and hexokinase, so on. So that's a little bit paradoxical. So what can account for this? Again, when we look at the properties uh, of these exercises, we're struck by, uh, by something of a paradox. If we look at the duration, HIT and strength training uh, are more like each other than they are like endurance training, with both featuring bouts of intense and discontinuous activity, and endurance training featuring extended bouts of continuous activity. Fiber type recruitment, to the extent that we have good data, appears to be far more comprehensive in both HIT and strength training. Um, uh, again, more like uh, each other than like endurance training. So I don't think fiber recruitment actually accounts for the discrepancy. Uh, at the level of substrate and fuel utilization, uh, the literature tells us that HIT and resistance training have similar profiles. Uh, corresponding to their similar energy system utilization. HIT almost certainly digs deeper into uh, aerobic metabolism uh, than strength training does, but strength training probably uses more mitochondrial metabolism than is traditionally taught. And in any event, I don't think that this per particular parameter accounts for the difference. So we have a paradox. These, uh, this is not just my observation, um, but uh, although I'm very intrigued by it, uh, a number of authors, including uh, the noted Australian exercise physiologist John Hawley, have asked whether this profound impact of HIT, with training in the anaerobic range producing very powerful aerobic adaptations, um, should prompt a reevaluation of the principle of training specificity. Now, in truth, I don't think John Hawley is any more inclined to throw away the principle of training specificity than I am, but it is curious, and there must be something about HIT. Um, that causes this adaptive response, and it's incumbent on exercise physiology to figure out what it is, which they haven't yet, uh, and for us um, to understand it and potentially exploit it for ourselves and our clients. And so, for example, there are parameters in which HIT looks more like endurance training than resistance training. Um, the range of rest intervals in both HIT and resistance training vary widely but I think you can make a pretty good case that, um, in general, the rest intervals in HIT are much shorter than they are for resistance training, um, especially as, uh, than they are for strength training, especially as strength training is practiced in the field. Um, strength training rest intervals in the literature often tend to be ridiculously short, but the way that you and I do strength training, they aren't. Um, endurance training rest intervals are non-existent. It's continuous activity. There are no intervals. So um, this is one area where HIT and strength training uh, seem to diverge, at least somewhat. Short or non-existent rest intervals may signal for a more aerobic phenotype, uh, possibly through stimulation of AMPK or, and or CAMK processes with concomitant inhibition of mTOR um, and uh, decreased muscle protein accretion. Dr. Baraki will be talking about these systems in detail, and I'll be interested to hear what he has to say. There's an even more dramatic divergence in the realm of force production. So the forces generated in endurance training and HIT uh, are far lower than they are for strength training. And this can have a profound effect on signaling, on gene transcription and expression, 
and the ultimate adaptive phenotype. For example, it may be, and I'm just speculating here, um, that high force production favors signaling through an mTOR-like pathway uh, at the expense of CAMK and AMK signaling, uh, pr promoting a more hypertrophic and anaerobic phenotype uh, with lower muscle oxidative capacity, but a greater ability to generate force. Again, I'll be interested to hear what Austin has to say in his review of uh, signaling and gene expression. And then finally, when I sort of was talking to some of my clients about this project, they counseled me and told me that I was neglecting what might be called the, um, the intensity of suckage, uh, uh, which almost everybody finds to be far higher for a hit than just about any other exercise modality. Um, that's hardly an objective phenomena, but it does seem to be the case that um, that hit sucks, and it does it is performed at a very very high intensity, and I think it does raise uh, seriously raise questions of central command and nervous system recruitment, uh, which will perhaps be addressed by um, CJ or by John. So, uh, before I state my conclusions. Uh, I think there are still a lot of questions and mandates uh, for future research. First of all, we need a better real-time picture of substrate utilization uh, during heavy strength training. We think we know what the relative contributions of substrates and fuels are uh, during a heavy bout, um, but there's precious little hard data from humans on this. Um, and perhaps even more importantly, I think we need a be better picture of muscle metabolism during interset rest, because I think interset rest um, may be a very important factor um, in our training. Clearly, oxidative metabolism is important here, the, the K-PCR uh, example, but the picture remains a, real, a, a little bit murky. And I think this is important because another question is, what is the role of interset rest on, not only on the muscle metabolism, but on the ultimate uh, signaling and gene expression and adaptive response? So, you know, it, the question is, is, is interset rest and the length of interset rest a major branch point in determining the ultimate phenotypic adaptation to exercise? And finally, uh, I think we can all agree that uh, research on resistance training uh, uh, and its impact on muscle and whole body oxidative metabolism needs to very carefully distinguish and compare untrained sedentary with trained active populations because there seems to be a differential response of these populations when it comes to endurance to strength training. And John and CJ will talk about that in more detail. So in conclusion, my reading of the literature on at the level of muscle and bioenergetics is that the literature on this topic is very complicated by inconsistencies in the experimental approach. So we spent a lot of time comparing apples to oranges, uh, especially with regard to the design of experimental strength training protocols, which ultimately bear very little resemblance to strength coaching and programming as they're practiced in the field. But if we sort of set that aside for the moment, uh, the literature gives us a pretty clear picture of divergent bioenergetic, cellular, and tissue level adaptations to strength and endurance training. Um, and. Uh, you end up with two different phenotypes. You end up with a strength training phenotype, high anaerobic capacity, high force and power generation, high, lots of hypertrophy on the one hand, and then you end up with the running phenotype on the other hand, which is at the opposite end of the spectrum. There are some studies in which strength training does seem to improve aerobic metabolism and uh, oxidative capacity, but this is not the general trend in the literature and the studies that do demonstrate this adaptation tend to involve older and more deconditioned subjects and to use shorter rest intervals, uh, protocols closer to circuit training or HIT. HIT is sort of this very intriguing bridge between these modalities and I believe it can be illuminating and it represents a potential violation of adaptation specificity vis-a-vis -vis performance um, in, in a way that hasn't been adequately explained by the physiology yet. Uh, it might be explained by comprehensive fiber recruitment, more comprehensive energy system utilization, uh, high intensity but low force production, and short rest intervals, but we just don't know. And finally, from a biochemical and bioenergetic perspective, I believe it can fairly be said that classic strength training 
uh, is insufficient to produce a comprehensive adaptation at the muscle, uh, level of muscle tissue, um, uh, indicating the need for a training modality to promote greater muscle oxidative capacity. In other words, there needs to be some form of conditioning. 